For 150 years, the American Public Health Association's dedicated public health officials and organizations have worked diligently to create the world's healthiest nation. APHA is the only organization that combines a broad-based member community with the ability to influence policy and improve the public's health. From the beautiful city of Boston, this is the 2022 APHA Annual Meeting and Expo, and this is APHA TV. Hello and welcome back to Boston. I'm Atria Gonfrey, your host for this fourth and final day of APHA TV. As we round out this year's meeting, our focus today turns to the critical role of ethics in public health policy and decision making and the social determinants that impact people's access to public health. We sit down with the Dean of Boston University's School of Public Health to discuss data science and how it will impact social determinants in the future. Plus, we get an education from Kaiser Permanente about their new Food is Medicine initiative. And we are talking one-on-one -on -one with a top USDA official about how to deal with food insecurity. It's a jam-packed final day, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. So much specially curated content to cover, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course, on our YouTube and Twitter feeds. First, we get started today with our sit-down interview with the Boston University Dean of the School of Public Health, Sandra Galea, here to talk a little bit more how health data will be used in decision-making when it comes to public health. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. First, let's start off with defining exactly what we mean when we talk about health data. When we think about health data, historically, we have thought about things like electronic health records, data about your doctor's appointment, data about your blood pressure, and about your cholesterol when you see your doctor. But as we recognize that health is produced not just by medicine, health is produced by the world around us. This is APHA. It's all about understanding that health is produced by the air, air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, our jobs, our environment. One realizes that we need data on those forces as well in order to understand health. So what we have been trying to do is to push the conversation and to say, if there are these determinants of health that we've called historically the social determinants of health, that we need data about those determinants to also inform how we understand health. Okay, and so to that point, there has been a 3D commission that has put together a report. This is a joint effort between Boston University and the Rockefeller Foundation. Correct. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so the commission is called 3D because it's data, determinants, and decision making. So the idea was, how do we think about collecting data from these multiple sources to the end of understanding the full set of forces that generate health so that we can make better decisions, so that policymakers can make decisions that actually improve health. Now that's actually quite a shift from how we typically have done this because really it has been data about health outcomes that have fed into policy, meaning percent of people with diabetes, percent of people who have heart attacks, um, oh, prevalence of okay. cancer. So really we have used data strictly from the place of the health outcome, so mm -hmm. measuring, me measuring health, that still remains important. And now what we're saying is we should extend our lens on data to understand what drives health. And in doing so, we can make decisions about how to optimize what drives health to keep people healthy. And so the 3D Commission has published a report about a year ago about their findings. Are there any key aspects from that report that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, the 3D Commission came up with a set of principles and a set of recommendations. So number one is we need to move beyond thinking about data as a single narrow stream, the data that's collected on me when I go to my doctor's office, to collecting data about the world around us. That's number one. Number two is once you do that, you need a system of accountability to that data and a system of transparency about how that data then goes on to introduce decisions that shape policy. So it really elevates our game of engagement with that and feeding that in a way that is translatable and understandable to those who are in a position to make decisions that shape the population's health. So it is a much more dynamic and engaged view of collecting data about everything that shapes our health and a system of putting responsibility on all of us to act on those data to create better health. When you're talking about, you know, an environmental, uh, taking environmental data and applying it to someone's health, 
you're talking about not only looking at my blood pressure, my cholesterol levels, but also taking into account what might be in the water that I'm drinking. Well, that's correct. I think what might be in the water, but also things like minimum wages. So for example, data about minimum wage and the extent to which different minimum wages are associated with people's health. That should be part of the conversation when there are conversations about setting minimum wages. Data about um, types of cities and building codes and different urban planning. And how does that influence decisions that are made about building in cities and what are the implications of that for health? Data about any range of forces and well done. So yes, water quality, air quality and from the point of view of climate and, and, and all that. So really it's saying that if we know there is no health without a healthy world, well, then we should be measuring the elements that make that world healthy so that we can actually move us in that direction. Fascinating. All right. How do you think that the growth and maturity of data science will help our understanding of social determinants in the future? Yeah, I feel quite optimistic about this and that uh, there is, as you correctly say, there is an explosion of interest in data science. And population health science is about collecting the data and analyzing it to the end of understanding what generates health and what generates health equity. And we haven't talked much about health equity, so just to put it in the conversation, that what we're doing is not simply improving health, but also narrowing health gaps. It is not good enough to simply say, we're gonna improve health on aggregate if some people are health left behind. We are beginning to recognize that having big data, data with large volume that we collect quickly to inform our understanding of the world around us is becoming much more commonplace and we're getting better and better at learning how, what to do with that. And all of those data should be then informing the decisions we make to optimize our environment. Fascinating, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks for breaking it down for the layman like me. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Kent State University's College of Public Health seeks out research collaborations and community partnerships in an effort to improve public health through innovative approaches. The Center for Public Policy and Health is a um, research center in the College of Public Health here at Kent State University. Over the past 10 years or so, we've uh, secured about $12 million in federal, state, and local funding to do mostly projects focused on the early detection and prevention of substance use and mental health disorders. The center is working to develop services and products that kind of fill a gap and have broad appeal both internationally and nationally. For example, with our mental health gatekeeper trainings, we found that with um, providing that to teachers in schools, a lot of the programs that already existed for gatekeeper trainings were, were too long or focused too much on like one specific topic. And so we've had to develop our own training so that we can implement this in the schools and it actually fits and it can be used by the schools expanding substance use treatment or mental health treatment, we don't provide those services uh, through the center, so we have to collaborate with agencies that do. So these agencies probably wouldn't secure that funding because they don't have the resources to do that. They also usually don't have the resources to manage large projects, so we take care of that side of things. If those collaborations weren't there, those services wouldn't be able to benefit communities. And so I think we want to continue to grow that side of the center and those collaborations. One of the biggest issues affecting public health is an individual's access to healthy and nutritious food. Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity at the USDA, Sarah Bleich, has been working hard to make food insecurity a thing of the past. My job is Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity at the Food Nutrition Service, which is a brand new position to USDA. And my charge is to execute on the Secretary's vision around nutrition security, which essentially means consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, and affordable food that is essential to good health and well-being. And for me personally, it's such a privilege to be able to work at USDA on these programs because as a child, my family received SNAP, which formerly was food stamps. We received WIC. We received school meals for a period. And so now I have the privilege of trying to make these really strong programs even stronger. First and foremost, it is so important that we use the nutrition assistance programs, of which there are more than 15, and they, they together serve one in four Americans over the course of a year, that we not just use them to help all who are eligible, but we also use them to disproportionately benefit in a positive way those who are historically underserved. So just as an example, now almost all folks who participate in SNAP can use their benefits online. 
And this is a game changer because it puts healthy food within reach. We are also working with a pilot project to bring the WIC program online, which is also going to be a big change for folks that participate in that program. The second thing is that food security is associated with a host of negative outcomes. So things like diet-related diseases, and we know among children that children who are food insecure are more likely to have problems with academic performance, with behavioral problems, and so if we can get a handle on food insecurity, we will meaningfully impact equity. And then the third thing is that the number one message that I took away from the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health is that the problems of diet-related diseases and disparities are almost entirely preventable. So they're not easy to solve, but if we have a whole of country approach and we work toward ending hunger and reducing diet-related diseases and disparities by 2030, we will make an impact on, on health equity and improve it in a meaningful way. What's important for listeners to understand is that all of this nutrition security work is building on and complementing decades-long work at USDA around food insecurity. So we're not getting rid of food insecurity, we're continuing that focus, but we're widening the aperture to recognize that diet-related diseases and disparities are a huge problem right now that we need to address them head on. And so the distinction for folks to understand about what is it that's different about nutrition security compared to our past efforts is one, that we're really prioritizing equity and two, that we recognize that systematic inequities make it hard for many people to get access to healthy food. And keeping on this topic now, Kaiser Permanente understands all too well that healthcare doesn't start in the doctor's office. Let's take a look at how they are helping improve communities with their food is medicine movement. In 2020, we surveyed um, our members and we asked them about some of the social needs and social health issues that they've been struggling with. And almost 30% of our members identifying access to healthy food as one of the challenges they're facing. So at that point, we embarked on a human-centered design process to really design our strategy of what was the role of healthcare in being part of the solution and what was the role specifically of Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser has been really innovative in thinking about how to link uh, people who are qualified to federal nutrition programs in implementing medically tailored meals and produce prescription programs. Kaiser Permanente is proud to support this effort with a $50 million commitment to make a difference in this space. I look forward to the coming months, years, as we all figure out the right roles and co-create what's possible here to really make a difference so that no one goes to bed hungry. Turning now to the critical role that ethics play in public health policy and decision making, how do ethical questions differ from evidence or data questions? Well, we put that question and more to Lisa Lee and also caught up with Howard Coe about the role faith-based leaders play in the evolution of public health. Ethics is part of everything we do in public health. Public health professionals will make hundreds of decisions every day, and in that decision-making comes evidence, of course, but importantly, also ethics and community experience, lived experience. So we have to remember that while we're talking about decisions that we generally base on evidence, every public health decision we make, because public health is for the public, every decision we make has to consider what the public values. The APHA adopted uh, in 2019 the Public Health Code of Ethics, um, and it was the result of a four-year deliberation across the public health community, not just APHA, but all uh, many, many other partners we have uh, in public health. And that Public Health Code of Ethics is, is more than a code of conduct. It's actually an outline of our core values in public health. And then it also um, supplies a framework, and a decision-making framework that public health professionals who are on the front lines doing the important work that we do every day can, can put into that framework the facts of the matter, the data, the evidence, as well as the values and lived experience and really come out of um, that process with a decision that is well supported by the community. And it's that kind of well supported decision that makes communities engage with public health and shows that we're tr trustworthy, worthy of the trust they give us. We all know that right now, 
issues of trust in health messengers is front and center. We're all wrestling with the fact that the vaccination rates for COVID are not nearly what they should be for primary vaccination and boosters. And so studies have shown that it's really local trusted messengers that are most effective in helping build trust, improve education, and then heighten vaccination rates. And faith leaders are a great example of that. So I've been very blessed to have a career that's involved being a doctor, a clinician, a state health commissioner, and most recently, U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama administration. And through all those roles, I've seen very powerfully time and again how communities in general and faith communities in particular impact people's lives and their health. So communities bring out a sense of belonging and connection for people and faith brings a sense of meaning and purpose and commitment to the sacred in people. And when you combine it all with faith communities, that combines the best of belonging and belief. So I think it's a natural collaboration that we public health leaders should pursue to make uh, our communities healthier going forward. New York Presbyterian's Dalio Center for Health Justice undertakes a wide range of projects internally and within its surrounding community, all focused on tackling inequities in healthcare. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, in the shadow of what we were seeing in terms of COVID-19 and the first waves of the pandemic and the crystallization of the disparities that we saw, we knew at New York Presbyterian that we had to do something. So the Dalio Center was born. The Dalio Center for Health Justice is a center that focuses on health equity and health justice for patients across the New York Presbyterian health system. Many people don't realize that health care is only about 20% of someone's overall health. The others are the social determinants of your health. We collaborate with community-based organizations so that we can be 20%, but also the rest of that 80% as well. The National Collaborative for Health Equity works with a vast number of leaders and organizations all across the country with one common goal in mind, ending racism and the health inequities that come with it. More than 200 jurisdictions in this country have declared that racism is a public health crisis. Racism permeates every aspect of our society. The mission of the National Collaborative for Health Equity is to promote health and end health inequities. Collaborative is in the center of our name and it really embodies the way in which we work. We know that we have to work together to end racism and that is the only way to end health inequities. Our vision for NCHE is to continue to be a partner with others in achieving a cultural transformation in this country where America truly becomes a culture of health for all. From the recent floods in Kentucky to the devastating impact of Hurricane Ian in Florida, we have certainly had our fair share of natural disasters as of late. But how do these impact overall public health? Here to discuss this morning is Professor and Chair-Elect of the Environment Section for APHA, Natasha Dejarnet. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with the big question. For people who may not put two and two together, how do natural disasters, climate change, impact overall public health? 
Absolutely. There are a number of climate impacts to health, and that includes poor air quality, that includes extreme heat, extreme weather. We also have extremes in precipitation, flooding on one hand, drought on the other, and changes in vector-borne diseases. So this can increase our risk of cardiovascular diseases. This can also increase our risk of respiratory diseases, heat-related illness, um, diseases that might be related to malnutrition or poor nutrition. In addition, it doesn't only affect our physical health, climate can also impact our mental health and well-being. You know, I think that uh, obviously climate change, the impact of climate change is very far-reaching, but it does seem to impact maybe disproportionately those that have already been subjected to structural racism. Do you agree with that? And if so, what can we do about that? I absolutely do agree about it, and I am appreciative that you brought this topic to the forefront because climate change is a threat multiplier for the populations that are most burdened. And these often can be those that are often bearing the burden of structural racism. And this is for a number of reasons. There are historically um, structurally racist policies that continue to shape our community even after they've ended for 50 years. So, for example, redlining. Communities that were formerly redlined um, still today face disproportionate health burdens um, and they face disproportionate climate burdens that impacts their health. So, for example, formerly redlined communities are hotter. Their surface temperatures are hotter, so they're more likely to be those urban heat islands. They also are more likely to be in flood zones. In addition, they are more likely to have poor air quality. And so these can be linked with conditions like cardiovascular disease and asthma in our children, um, also for our older adults, um, and populations that would bear a greater burden in those ways. Uh, so there are a number of historic policies that can contribute to why climate change's burden is not evenly distributed across our communities. So what can we do about it? There's much that can be done, especially in the place of public health. So there is the Health in All Policies Framework. This ensures that health and equity are at the center of policy. So when it comes to climate policies, utilizing a Health in All Policies Framework to identify mitigation and adaptation preparedness, this can really help strengthen our communities, ensure that equity is at the center of climate action. In addition to that, for those of us that work in research like myself, you can engage in community-based participatory research. This is where the community is involved from the beginning, from not just the beginning of with here's our project, this is what we're going to do. No, from identifying what the problem is and what the solution should be all the way through evaluating and implementing, and implementing the project. All right, uh, before I let you go today, so you know, I mentioned the floods in Kentucky, also obviously Hurricane Ian in Florida. We have had, our, like I said, our fair share of natural disasters it seems. Do you think that with the uh, frequency that we're starting to see these natural disasters, that that's a precursor of things to come here in the United States? Absolutely. With, with climate change, we're seeing more frequent and more intense extreme weather, and we're also seeing more frequent and more intense extreme precipitation, whether that's flooding and whether that's drought. So yes, this is a sign of things to come. This is a unfortunate wake-up call for us that this is happening now, that this is real, that it's affecting health today, but also reminding us there's much that we can do about it. We can do things that can prepare our communities for the threat of these extreme weather, extreme rainfall events, but also that we can mitigate to prevent this. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for your time today. Certainly appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And with that, it's a wrap for APHA TV from this year's APHA Annual Meeting and Expo. Did you know the very first APHA Annual Gathering took place in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1873? We've come a long way in our 150 years of creating the healthiest nation and look forward to many more. So much specially curated content to cover and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course on our YouTube and Twitter feeds.
Thanks for being with us here in Boston. We look forward to seeing you next year in Atlanta. Until then, have a great one.